me, if you do not know. Um, I have been a supporter of your podcast and of your work from day one. Day one, day. You're one of the day one, day one. Yes, from day one. And you followed the podcast before I had content. <laughs> yes, because I listen. Listen, we're gonna get into into <laughs> into that a little bit later on, but yes, day one. I'm here. I love everything that you're doing. And I, as I said before, when I created this topic about focusing on the influence of Black music, you're the first person that I thought of that was just like, I have to get this person. If I don't get this person, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this topic because who really? can my brain put together right, right now? Um, and it's because of the way you... Um, the way on your podcast that you present your perspectives when it comes to music is not surface. And I truly appreciate that because we get a lot of surface, you know, in everything else. But when we don't get the surface, a lot of people tend to tone out because of, you know, the trend and, you know, people not really listening to understand. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that, like, your podcast made me feel like I'm not alone. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I have conversations with people about music and it's just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Like they don't know nothing I'm talking about. Like, I'm talking another language. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's because we're having so much surface conversations and not really digging a little deeper, mm -hmm. which is again why I created the open conversation. Nice. So, I love it. Just to go ahead and, and get us started in, in the feel of everything. Um, if people that are watching this may not know, today's topic of discussion is about the influence of Black music. And we're going to be pulling the layers of the onion, y'all, okay? We are not going to be talking about, you know, <laughs> who's popular, who's not, and who did this and who did that, but truly about the history behind Black music and how it has influenced us on multiple different levels. So me introducing myself, I am the Woman with Goals, and this is The Open Conversation. This is a space where we come together and we talk about topics that are not widely discussed in the world or within our community. This is also a space for us to learn more about ourselves and the people that is around us in our environment. And I'm so grateful to have our guest here as I'm gonna allow her to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Odelia and I am the creator, host, and what else? I have a lot of hats, but I recently started a podcast called Peace and Love Cast, and that's how I met our beautiful host today. So, peace and love. Yes, peace and love always. So, as I said, um, today's topic is definitely going to be pulling the layers of the onion. And as I like to uh, usually do with my guests, is to start off with a um, I guess you could say an opener, a warm up, so that okay. we can get to know a little bit more about who we are as two people having this conversation. So, our <laughs> warm up question today is going to be: What is one song that can that? What is one song that describes who you are as a person today? Wow, that's a great question. Hmm. Okay. So there is an artist that I grew up listening to. My parents listened to. His name is Peter Tosh. It's a, he is a reggae artist. Hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. He was actually part of the Whalers with Bob Marley and wrote a lot of the Whalers <laughs> material. Okay. But he had more of a rebel vibe. Um, not so much Kumbaya, One Love. He kind of spoke more. Of so he has a song called I Am That I Am. So it's like, when you ask me who I am, I am who I am. And it kind of plays mm -hmm. on scripture when um, I believe it was Moses who was like, okay, so who should I tell these people that you are when you say that I'm supposed to give them these instructions? And the most high was like, I am who I am. And so that is basically me. Like, I know that people might think like, oh, how do you know? How are you so sure of things? I am what I am. Like, I am what I am. I know what my principles are. I know what my morals are. I was raised a certain way. Um, and so I feel like that song might be one of the songs that describes me. It's a very, it's a very melodic, 
even tone, even pace song. And it's from like, I want to say the 70s, 70s or the 80s, but don't quote me on that. But Peter okay, Tosh, okay. I am. Well, I got to look into that. I got to look into that. I know my parents were both very big fans of Bob Marley. So I got to look into that. All right. So, but for myself, it's definitely, everybody knows me, knows I love um, India Ari. Okay. A very, very big part in my childhood as I developed and understood who I was. Just not as a, just not only as a black little girl, but just a being as a whole. And one song that resonated with me when it first came out when I was like in elementary school, and it has resonated with me now today more than ever is um, her song "Video." I don't think I know that one. No, it's um. Oh my god, what are the lyrics? I'm not the average girl like the video. Okay. I'm not like a supermodel, but I like to live myself unconditionally and okay. as a That's little girl perfect. listening to that I didn't understand all the words put together but watching the video itself the music video and listening to her sing it it did give me some form of empowerment of like it's okay to be who you are and today as an adult I am 100% in that space of like no, I'm not your average, and that is a good thing. I am yeah. beyond the average, mm -hmm. so it it definitely resonates with with the frequency that I am, I am in today. That's beautiful. Yes. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into our conversation about the influence of black music. Starting it off with our first question, which is directed towards us. So how has music influenced your life and the person you have become today? That's a good, that's a good question. Okay. Um, so I know we're gonna be talking about the history of music and all that good stuff, but I, I wanna say that I'm gonna answer as honestly as I can. Yeah. And from my perspective, I'm not a historian, but you know, from my perspective, I will answer your questions. I think for me, Music always was coupled with some type of creative expression. So I did dancing growing up. And so it was always coupled with dancing, choreography, movement, that type of expression. So it wasn't me choosing the music. It was more, it was curated and then you dance to it and you perform to it. So I danced from like elementary school all the way through college. Um, and it wasn't until recently, I feel like I started to develop my musical taste and what I really think exemplifies me or resonates with me. So I feel like in terms of my life, it has always been music and choreography, music and movement, music and expression. Now it's like listening to music because it has some type of um, content in it that is resonating with me. Um, it's <laughs> like you said, a lot of surface stuff today. So I tend to dig back in the past for, for my uh, musical experiences. Um, and so that's where I'm at right now. Kind of just like digging through the looking for those foundational um, artists and musicians that I think were ahead of their time. Mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> and, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I, I feel you on that because a lot of the, the, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the artists of the past, although they may have made or released this music so long ago, I believe in like real good music is timeless. It oh, doesn't sure. have like a, a start and an expiration date. It literally can travel like even beyond our our lives today, which is, mm -hmm. makes it so amazing. Um, yeah. I would say for myself, music, my music catalog has been pretty interesting um, since I was a child because both of my parents were really old. So I didn't really listen to what people consider today's music until like seventh or eighth grade. Okay. But a lot of the music that I listened to and loved was based on the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and a little bit of the early part of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so I tell people all the time, my favorite artist of all time is not your typical like <laughs> you would expect for someone my age like I love Barry White oh that's a good one okay 
Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Now, can I talk to my peers about Barry White? Okay. <laughs> okay. I would have to talk to somebody's grandma or mama about Barry White, but that's okay. And it helps me to like my journey through music has helped me to understand like the music back then was really about the soul and the spirit. Mm -hmm. and the connection with music. And as I got older and I was a cellist for 11 years. Wow, I didn't know that. And to classical music, I attached myself to particular composers because they really put their soul and spirit into writing this classical music. Yeah. So for me, I look at music as being a very spiritual part of me. It has helped me get through a lot of things. It has helped me to realize who I am as a being. It has helped me to understand my position, you know, on this earth. So music has influenced me in a multitude of ways and, and multitude of experiences I've had in my life. That's great. I feel like I came to that realization recently and that's what influenced my podcast and now I kind of understand why you're so drawn to the podcast because it does talk about the intersection of humanity and spirituality and music as like a meditation a healing mm -hmm. you know that that type of stuff so yeah that's really great you're like ahead of the game yeah yeah definitely I feel like there is a um, some rumblings around amongst younger people that are starting to dig in the past and talk about mm -hmm. music. And I feel like that happens, it's like a cycle every so often, like things come back around. So I feel like right now that's starting to happen. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. To dig a little bit more in the past, but yeah. Yeah. Like some people think <laughs> the, the Isley Brothers came out in the 90s. Okay, well, <laughs> you have to educate them. That's your right? job. Right, and so there's a lot of, a lot of a lot of information behind music and how much it has traveled but I, I am grateful that it is starting to be a little bit more conversations around influences and I think that's a big part of also the artists today starting to sample some of these artists and um, I was speaking to someone most recently about TikTok and yeah. they were telling me how um, they then find out that this particular artist existed like years ago until um, a, a becoming artist sampled one of their songs mm -hmm. and then made the comparison of both of the songs together. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it's, it's becoming more interesting and in seeing like how it's unfolding and how people of the younger generations are making the connections. I hope that this continues and that we really get into the depth of it and doesn't become like this trend for like this year and the next year we just like stop, but we shall see. Well, you're part of that work, I guess, right? Yeah. To keep that conversation open, pun intended. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's true, that's true. So next we're gonna get into talking more about Black artists, their music, and how it has influenced not only us too as well, but the world. So what Black artists do you think influence the music we hear today? <laughs> that's a loaded yeah. question. Yeah. Because I feel like putting the construct or category or whatever you want to call it a black before music makes it seem that it's like a particular group that makes a certain type of music, but all music came from quote unquote black people. There was this um, chart of music um, mm -hmm. that I believe Dr. Portia, let me, let me put, I posted it on the page. Oh, the evolution of, of, of music, right? And it's it's by ethnomusicologist Dr. Portia Maltzby. Okay. And she started all the way back from sacred tra traditions, so slave, oh, wow. hymnal stuff, and works all the way down to neo soul, hip hop, mm -hmm. jazz, all that. And there's it starts from the ninth to sixteen hundreds, and it ends at the nineteen nineties. Okay. Right? So in there is rock and roll, house, quartet gospel, like everything, soul. So people will be like, oh, that's black music. But really the origins are from the people who have the experiences and who sang about them. And those traditions and that spirit carried on over time and morphed into other things as the context changed, right? Yeah. So music is us. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up. Right. I'm glad you brought that 
people have stolen so much of it over the years. So. Right. But yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up about like, this is a history thing, right? Like, I think sometimes we have this perception that there are like black artists that have only influenced um, today's music or that they only influence a certain timeline, like the 90s or the early 2000s and things have changed. Not even understanding that this goes all the way back to almost the beginning, as you said, the 1600s, mm -hmm. where it's like, we sometimes don't really want to acknowledge that, I feel. Like it's almost like we know it, we feel it. We, we, we know that it's facts, but there's so much pushback into admitting that this is the case, that like we are the foundation of the sound, the frequencies that come out that we hear in our ears, whether it's rock and roll or jazz or hip hop or classical or pop or whatever you want to call it, whatever genre you want to put it into, there is some form of influence that goes all the way back and it re it comes back to us. So yeah. that makes me also think like, why do you feel like that's not really a part of the conversations that people are having when it comes to speaking about music history? Because I don't, it has to be an interest there. Like mm -hmm. if you're not interested in going back and I don't feel like there is enough of, um, curiosity and inquiry into the past and where things came from. You know, there's, there's been several instances recently where younger artists didn't know who the artist was and like try to dismiss them. And then the powers that be, AKA social media, had to be, get them in. Yes. There's been right. so many instances of that. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, how do, you, do you not realize that you wouldn't be such and such if this person didn't do this and that, you know? So I feel like, What's happening today is people there. I feel like music reflects the time, right? And back in the day, there were real social things that were going on that music was the outlet for people to release all of this pain mm -hmm. and their experience and their joy as well, right? But now today it's more of feel good music and club music or just wanting to build a vibe. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, is less of that like really heavy stuff, really talking about stuff, really substantial stuff. So it's like, why dig in the past? Why? Mm. You know, Drake just sampled whoever else or this person just sampled whoever else. And it's like, we're just gonna start from there. And mm. also I feel like a lot of our history, or I should say the history that's given, especially in academia, it's, you're given a starting point. So if you accept that starting point, then <laughs> it kind of like helps to chart your path into what you're going to accept, right? You have to be curious enough or have the mindset to question and push back and, you know, not just accept in order to figure out something else. Right. So I don't know if there's enough of that going on as opposed to influencer culture and, you know what I mean? Just, you know, the feel good stuff. Like, that's what I think is what's prevalent today. Yeah, and I 100% agree that we are focusing more on, again, the feel good music, the what's popping right now, what sounds good right now. But it reminds me of like, people forget, like when you see an artist, that artist is a representation of several other artists that they have looked up to, studied, or to some extent it has inspired them to become who they are today as an artist. And that's like every single one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was actually D'Angelo that spoke about when you are listening to someone, know that you are listening to also the multiple people that comes behind them, like dig into those people that are behind them as well. And you'll really see the foundation of where their music comes from. And I feel like that's the journey that I'm on now is, really understanding that every artist that I love to listen to or truly inspired by their music, where did this come from? Because it didn't come from thin air, right? We are influenced by somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's a part that we're not really paying attention to that can possibly trigger that, um, that interest in digging back to history.
Oh, of course, definitely. That's my case. Like, okay, so like I'm gonna put this camera down a little bit so you can see my little D'Angelo Apollo shirt. Yes. <laughs> there you go. But this, so I recently learned of though, like 2021 when he did verses and mm -hmm. started my inquiry into music from the late 60s and 70s. Wow. And that's when I found, you know, the whole funk crew, the funk parliament, mm -hmm. you know, Fly Stone. Ohio players, Zap and and uh, Roger and the Zap band, like yeah. all of those people. Okay, and Leroy Bonner from the Ohio players is one of my favorite voices. You know what I mean? So like I started digging back because this artist piqued my interest, but this artist has depth and has been talking about things. I feel like if they were surface, then I don't know if I would have connected that much to care enough to know what the origins of their music is. Like where are you getting this from? So what you just described is literally what happened in my case. Yeah. Love that. I love that. So do you believe that um, the influence of what we consider to be Black music, because this is this is thing going around that um, Black music only inspires or um, influences other Black people or the Black community? And I feel like, again, that comes from this thing that we are trained to think is that like black music is a box, right? There's only certain categories that fall into that. And if it doesn't fall into that, then it's not related. Um, going back to what we said before about the foundation, a lot of the music that we listen to, no matter what genre it is, the foundation always comes back to us. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that it does influence beyond the black First of all, I've never heard that it didn't influence beyond. I feel like there's you just look at the statistics right. of who consumes quote unquote black music, aka hip hop, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Who consumes most of it? <laughs> it's not us. <laughs> First of all, like statistically, that's impossible, particularly in the United States, for example, that when you're a so called minority group, then you can't be the most. You can't be the group that's listening to it most when there's a group that trumps your size by like seven or eight times, right? right? So suburban children are listening to hip hop and emulating them. You see all of the culture vulture stuff that's going on today, right? Everything from music to what comes from the music, the style, the expression, the cadence and how you speak, all of that is influential. The right. hairstyles, the nails, everything is now oh, being yeah. like normalized, but you know, that's all part of the quote unquote culture. So right. I, I always feel like it's it's influenced outside of whatever box they tried to put it in. Yes, I, I, I 100% agree. So when I heard it, I actually took a music class and I wrote- What class was that? <laughs> Listen, um, it was required for my major. Oh, girl. But Man, this is what I was talking about earlier that in academia they try to scare you with certain mm -hmm. things and if you don't have the you know if you're not curious enough to dig or push back or ask questions then you're just gonna go right along the same river and right. then in the same places right but I wrote a paper on it was like one of the last assignments we had to do and I wrote a paper on about like again like us as black people with African Americans being the influence of the foundation of music across the board, across history. And my professor told me that the music I listen to doesn't influence anything but beyond my community. And that was just kind of like, does it really, like, do you, do you really understand what I'm saying, where, where I'm coming from with this? Um, but to make a long story short, she told me that I basically had to find another vocal point of my paper because the whole idea of the paper was to talk about the universal of music as a whole mm -hmm. and that my point was not making it universal and i'm just like is this how people think is yes think where you just think that like no that's not this is but when you speak of it it's not about you talking about the whole thing about something universal this is like oh no only for your community and that's it well that's why it's important for us to understand the importance of our um presence in certain spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Because you bring in a new perspective that you then can share. Now, 
pushback is part of the growing process, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes you be like, well, no. Right. I know that's not true. And here's why. You know, I hope that you went forward with the paper. I don't know. How did that turn out? Did you move forward? Did you change your voice of your paper? Um, I did change it, but I didn't change it to what she wanted it to be. I actually didn't talk, begin to talk about um, how a lot of artists steal from Black artists and the history behind that and how there's a replica of what we are actually doing today mm -hmm. um, when we think about it. So, well, there's no way I guess you need to thank her for making you even fine tune what you were saying in the first place. <laughs> right. You basically just reworded what you were saying in the first place. But I mean, yeah, I feel like it's everywhere. The influence is everywhere. And it may start from music, but this creative expression, there's so much there that comes from us that people steal. <laughs> um, and it is what it is. But when you're really good, I feel like it's two things. When you're really good at what you do, and you really understand the power and the power of music and you take your craft seriously, you have to, that comes with people wanting to copy you and follow you, right? Right. The other part is they never really can copy you and follow you because only you can do their thing. And there's lots of artists that I, you know that fall in that category. That's true. That's very true. That's very true. So moving on, pulling the layers, as I said, um, this question is based off of just our general perspective, but how do you feel about society painting an image of just Black artists or, you know, whatever they want to call it, producing music as being negative or harmful? Um, this is something that I discuss a lot with my, my friends, my colleagues, people in my age group about how like we all listen to this, like we all listen to this music, but at the same time, there's this perception of like, it's very negative, it's very um, low frequency as some people would say, or is not really contributing to the betterment of us as beings. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like that type of music um, is part of, a system that is designed to function the way that it's functioning. So if you have a system that says that certain people, in order to subject people to a certain expression, you have to criminalize them, then you can use powerful music as repetitious as music, as largely consumed as music to influence the folks. So if you are the head of music company, then you know, a big wig in the music, you're going to facilitate this perpetuation of whole content to then have that reflected in the in the actions of particular citizens and while you are reaping the benefit financially, right? So it's a plus for you as well as propping up the way the system is supposed to work. You know what I mean? So I feel like it's part of the system in design and you have to be smart to know that either you go independent, you're underground, right? Or you don't take that route. But it, once you take that mainstream route, <laughs> hey, you're going to be I subjected did. to that formula and you're going to fall into that cycle. Right. And I agree. I think my my biggest perspective on this is that it's all propaganda. It is propaganda. It, music is a frequency. Um, if it makes you feel good, if it makes you think positively about yourself, about the world, if it opens your mind up to the world, um, whether the lyrics you hear is positive or negative, because sometimes, although the lyrics may be a little negative, it makes you reflect on, like for me, it makes you reflect on the environment I grew up in, right? right? And how far I have come, people I know have come in that environment. So I think it, it getting, it's all propaganda in hopes that we follow what the people are saying, um, and to change things up for us as a whole, but it's all a setup. It's a setup and it's working. Yeah, and it, unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, it's- Is it it's unfortunate? Working. I mean, you have to be willing and open and able to, to, to receive that type of stuff. So there's lots of people that don't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't. That's very true. Right. 
to them, it's like, whatever. Right. Get to the bag. <laughs> that's the thing getting to the bag right and not really focusing on what you are producing mm -hmm. but again it's it's all a sub they know what they're doing they know who they're targeting um and i agree that it is up to us to change the narrative individually mm -hmm. and how you carry yourself and what you listen to and what you speak about um but going back to d'angelo he referred to a lot of the stuff as noise it really isn't uh -huh. Because music is a divine thing. It is a spiritual thing. And musicians had a particular place in uh, how people express themselves to the creator, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were very special people that played instruments and used their voice to make a mm -hmm. joy thing. Yeah. But now it's been reduced to most of the next kind of sound, repetitious sound. And I call it microwave music because it's like, what is this? Oh, is this <laughs> because this is how you're going to make your money. Right, so it is it music. It's 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 air pollution, noise, and air pollution is what the words that were used in the interview that Angelo had. Yes, yes, I remember that for interview. The air pollution that was a good one. That was a good one. But yeah, that that's all that it is. Um, going into our last question, based on your knowledge and what ways has the influence of Black music played a part in the political outcomes? I know that you talked about this very, very early on a little bit about just how a lot of people use music doing movements. Um, oh yeah, I did. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. No, in the ways that like that has helped us in so many different ways. Do you think that that still has an effect today? Um. So okay, first I'm going to say that in grad school I did a paper on the the use of music political campaigns. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like um, a repetitious soundbite or a, rep a repetitious campaign speech in which if you get popular artists to um, align with your campaign message and campaign with you or performances or you choose a particular song as a theme of your campaign, mm -hmm. then that repetitious stuff helps to uh, enforce your message into the people that you're trying to get to vote for you, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I think one of the examples I used was the presidential election of President Obama. And he used yeah. Sign, Still, Deliver as his main song of the campaign, mm -hmm. right? And that brings back so much memory for people who were growing up during a time when voting wasn't even part of what their vocabulary, mm -hmm. right? So he was mindful of that, that but he also had people like Jay-Z perform at certain, um, right. you know, political events. He had Daisy's wife be on safety form at the inauguration. Mm -hmm. So it was like he knew what he was doing by using music to bridge the gap and to enforce and have that message go over and over and over again in people's minds. So I feel like music maybe more so in the past was definitely used as part of political movements or social movements. Um, and it's like a unifying factor because I feel like back then the content in the music was an impression of the oppression and the things that they were experiencing right mm -hmm. so people could really identify with it like a voice like Aretha Franklin I mean Aretha Franklin yeah. sang one of, of Barack Obama's third inaugurations as well mm -hmm. so it's like a voice like that like of course it's gonna call the people to do it mm -hmm. um who 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 is what in today's world who is matching that voice and that substance today People say that she influences them and say that they draw inspiration from certain places, but do, are you really, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's all, it's all part of it. They use anything that they can. Like my father always says that the four things that rule the world are religion, politics, money, and sex. So if yeah. everything falls in those four buckets, no matter how you, how you slice it, in music today, they take it and they commodified it and made it into something to sell and gain from. So that falls into all of those categories to some extent. Yes. I mean, I feel like you wrapped that up. Oh, you yeah. the word. Also helps because it's go true. get through the things that we are going through and the experiences that we are having. Um, it also in connection to the things that are happening in the world. I mean, as you spoke about Obama's um, election, I remember very vividly the Young Jeezy song my president is black, my Lambo is blue. <laughs> Although when you think about it today, you're like, mm, that was not really that good. Um, 
<laughs> it was so in connection to what was happening and a reflection of how people felt overall. It was powerful at that moment. And there has been plenty of movements in history. I mean, you think about the civil rights movement. When you watch a movie that is based off of the civil rights, there's a particular sound that you always hear. Although the artist may be different and the song is different, it's always that same sound, same frequency happening. And it's because it is attached to the experience and the, the movement and the things that are taking place. So I try to remind myself that like, when I think about the things that are going on around me in my environment, there's a song attached to that. I mean, as I said earlier about, you know, the song that is really resonating with me right now is the NDIRE, um, the video. It's because it's a soundtrack of what I'm experiencing day by day right now. So mm -hmm. when I think about that song, you know, years later, I'm going to think about the things that I, I've been through when I listen to that song. And I feel like there's no way that we cannot connect music and life experiences and history together without really seeing that connection. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we are going to get into the process of wrapping up this conversation. So is there any other things that you want to say about your perspective on music on this topic of influence? Um, of Black music that we did not discuss today or bring up today? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, in general, I have, I take issue with the terminology Black because I feel like it is just a construct mm -hmm. that was created to subject people, a certain people to oppressive, oppressive things, right? Mm -hmm. So, I feel like people need to break out of, of that terminology. Any terminology that is sort of a construct of race or anything like that, it makes you do it. <laughs> Put yourself in your box, right? Music is music and it should be, people don't recognize that true music comes from the soul and is a spiritual practice and is a spiritual. Mm -hmm. And if I felt like if people really understood that, perhaps they would either step away from, <laughs> step away from the craft Mm -hmm. or really take it seriously and really study it and really try to perfect their talent, right? So right. I just want to encourage people to really think about what they're listening to mm -hmm. and know that that gets ingrained and etched in your psyche. And regardless if you try to say that it does, it does affect the decisions and the things that you do, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I'm very um, conscious of what I consume. I cannot consume any low vibration <laughs> melodies and frequencies, regardless of how big the artist is. Mm -hmm. I, you'd be surprised at the things I do not listen to. Like I couldn't tell you from like the biggest names today, right? So that's just something I want people to think about, you know? Yeah. Leave the music alone if you're not <laughs> serious, because you might get hurt. You might get her. Yes, and I, I love that you brought that up. That music, people don't really understand the power behind music because we are listening to something that is going in us. And yeah. We just think about it. I'm just listening to a song because it, 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 it sounds good or I like the artist, as you said, it's a big artist. We're not really consciously thinking about like, this is something that I am listening to that's going into me? Is it benefiting me? Is it uplifting me? Is it providing me with something that I need at this time and moment through what I'm going through in life? And not so much, oh, the beat sounds good or the artist is cute, so let me try to listen to her music, you know? That's not the same, the same thing. We need to be more conscious about that. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen those videos where they play music and then they show you the vibrations through like something like water or liquid and how it creates right. these patterns and stuff. It's the same thing that it does with the body. And certain frequencies and sounds does affect your mental health and mm -hmm. you know how you operate and how you think. I don't think people are aware of that. So if you're listening to things that are not harmonious or mm -hmm. it doesn't have a certain melodic framework to it, then it is harmful in a way. And to continue to subject your body and your mind and your soul to that type of frequency, over time, you're gonna get lower and lower in your vibration and be able to accept more and more garbage. 
But at the same time, like I'm just saying that in the hope that that drops on somebody's ears and they take it in. Mm-hmm. But I do understand that people are where they're at and that's good enough for them sometimes. But, you know, part of the what I try to do with my um, podcast is to dig deep into some of the, the legs that stem from fail artists like the Angelo, which right. is very, it's very, it has, it rests heavily on spirituality, humanity, thinking about what's going on around you, reflecting that in your music. And that's just only one part. It's the lyrics is one part, but then there's mm-hmm. the quality of playing the instrument. You know what I mean? On top right. of that. And then, you know, so it's like more than just putting sounds together and making mm-hmm. from, from it, you know? It's it's more than that. Right, definitely, definitely more than that. But I just wanna say thank you so much, Odelia, for being a part of this conversation. Before we even end, I have to give you your flowers because in the world of podcasts that we are <laughs> in today, <laughs> where everyone is making a podcast, I have to show gratitude and flowers to those that are really doing the work with integrity and it have a mission and an intention behind it. As I said um, earlier, I was the very first person to really like see this podcast and to see that it's going to go very far. You had no recordings, nothing. And I was just like, I'm going to I'm going to follow. I'm going to subscribe because, and I I never told you this story, but it's crazy that I found out about Peace and Love Podcast through Instagram. It was just randomly popped up, like, suggestions of people you should follow. Okay. Thanks, Instagram. Right. Thanks, Instagram. But before I even opened my Instagram, I was having a conversation with my best friend about my love for D'Angelo's music. And she was just like, I really don't understand why you really like this person. Like, I, she's, she's heard his music. She's like, it's all right. I'm like, all right. Girl, you know who you're listening to? <laughs> and I was just telling her that sometimes I wish that I could have or that I could resonate with someone that understands not only, you know, my interest in D'Angelo's music, but the interest of just music, period, and really understands it. And then I opened my Instagram, and that was the first thing I saw was Peace and Love podcast suggestions of people you should follow. Because the phone listens. Because the phone like listens. <laughs> but okay. I was just like, yo. And then when I saw everything play out on your on your Instagram about about how this podcast is going to go, I'm like, wait, I literally <laughs> just talked about this. Like, what is going on? Like, yeah, this this is too good to be true. Like, but you're really- doing. You're doing amazing work. Um, I just want you to know that no matter how many seasons you see this <laughs> podcast going, I'm going to be right there to the end. Okay, you can count on that. Thank you. We're in season three. It just kicked off in this month. Um, I'm getting ready to release episode two. Um, lots of great. I think this season is solid. <laughs> yeah, Jared's beyond um, solid. <laughs> beyond. So yeah, tune in to Peace and Love Cast um, on Instagram. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Um, yeah, we had Rocco DeLuca, who co-writer of one of D'Angelo's latest singles, Unshaken. Yeah, you know people were surprised. I got so many DMs like, Whoop! because just there's so many different angles, and his um, he's a bluegrass Delta blues grassroots artist, right? That plays a lot of steel. And a resonator guitar. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. So that's one thing. And then okay. the next episode is going to be with Phoenix Armando King, who is the actor, who's a notable actor, but he played D'Angelo in the Atlanta FX yes. episode. Um, Donald Glover. So right. it's like, there's, that's like, uh, there is different avenues that I can take and I'm taking them. And it mm-hmm. all stems from me finding D'Angelo's music. So, yeah. And I, I love it. I love that the encouragement of the, the encouragement you have within yourself to do this because you really just like went on it by faith and you're taking off so far. And I just I love it. I'm inspired by it. <laughs> keep going, keep doing it. Thank you. Just know I'm always gonna be here for it. Keep listening. <laughs> yes, I'm always gonna be here for it. All right. 
So and again, that is you and yeah. everything that you're doing too. I see all of the different things that you're doing, your yoga, your your daily series. You have like a exercise series that oh, you're yeah. doing. 365 days you're in school you just learned that you were a televist for a number of years right. so just keep you know fine-tuning who you are not let people bring your frequency down because the more you fine-tune that the brighter you're going to shine and so that comes with some unpleasant things so you just have to stay focused thank you thank you i appreciate that <laughs> thank you so much to be you are welcome. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. I'm grateful that I'm able to do this with you. And just good luck with this season. I know it's going to be great. I can't wait to see all the amazing conversations going to be happening with that. And that's all. Yes. Peace and love. Peace and love. Thank Peace you. Love. Bye. <laughs>